The following podcast is being brought to you by the Defy Life Podcast Network. Welcome to Aftergate, powered by the Defy Life Network. Aftergate is a podcast series highlighting Colgate alumni of color in their professional endeavors, Aftergate. Aftergate is hosted by Alvin Glimpf, a.k.a. Al, and Herman Dubois, a.k.a. Jerry. We are doing Aftergate because Colgate University has produced innovators who have changed the world every day, yet many alumni of color and the mainstream Colgate community are unaware of the amazing accomplishments of alums of color. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Aftergate. And for those who don't know, and you just stumbled upon us, <laughs> uh, so so our article in the Colgate magazine and said, let's check these guys out. Then let me share with you. Aftergate is a podcast where we are talking with alumni of color who've graduated from Colgate University and really having a conversation with them about not just their time at Colgate, but also here to document what they have done since Colgate and just kind of lift that up. And in the words of our previous guest, Wendy Perdomo, amplify their accomplishments, mm-hmm. right? We mm-hmm. like taking words from some of our previous guests and just incorporating them in the Colgate vernacular of Aftergate. Mm-hmm. So, but before we have that conversation, let me introduce my man. What's up, Herman Dubois? How you doing, brother? What's going on, brother Glyph? All is well, all is well. Alive and free and blessed. Good to hear, good to hear, good to hear. Um, you ready? Let's rock. I'm looking forward to speaking to this brother. Let's go, let's go. It's been a, um, I would like to introduce officially, class of 1980, Dr. Stephen Redman. Welcome to yeah. Aftergate. Welcome, welcome. God bless you. It's great seeing both of you. Same here, brother. Same here. Amen. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And so, as we usually do, I got to document for our listeners my first time interacting, meeting our guests. So, I am pretty certain I've never been in your presence physically, but I do remember... Um, it was a AOC Zoom call where you were on the call and you shared some pretty insightful comments in terms of what we were discussing that night. The most intriguing thing I learned out of that instance were that was that you had a daughter who attended Colgate. And to me, that was just mind boggling that, I mean, maybe I was a little jealous because I tried to get my children to attend Colgate and my wife would not allow it. But the whole idea of meeting a legacy within the alumni of color organization, I know you're not the only one, but it still to me is something that is few and far between. So that to me was worth noting at the time that, oh man, his daughter, what? So that's my first time meeting. I will will admit I did what I could to, give Tanae, introduce her to a lot of other options other than Colgate. Okay. And, uh, but, uh, you know, Colgate was among the ones that I, you know, was encouraging her to uh, to pursue. But I, I also, because of my experience at Colgate, the Colgate that I knew from, from 76 to 80, yes. um, I can be honest with you, I did not want my daughter to have that extent. 1976 to 1980 experience. Um, I would say as I, as it's turned out, I see that Colgate, thanks to brothers like the two of you and, and young women like my daughter have transformed Colgate. And, and I still see that it's transforming in a positive direction. And so um, I'm, I'm thankful that uh, Tanae did decide to, uh, to, uh, to go to Colgate. And uh, it reminded me of a little photograph that I had of her. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll send it to you. I, I may not even ask her permission, but she's got a little, she's, she's at a Father's Day 5K. 
at Central Park. And, uh, and I entered Tene in that 5K. Uh, she didn't run the 5K. They had a little kitty race. But she has on a Colgate. <laughs> she's got on a Colgate University oh, yeah. outfit. The, yeah. the burgundy shorts and a shirt that says Colgate <laughs> on it. And she's in my arms there standing there with Fred LeBeau. A Please send it. President of uh, Colgate of, of, of the New York Roadrunners Club. And so that was 10A's first race. She won her, she won her age group. She was in the 11th, 11 month old. I think she was the one year old age group. And uh, <laughs> she was the only, she was the only runner entered at that, at that age group. And so that's, uh, <laughs> I guess it was, what I'm getting at, it was destined. It was destined. <laughs> yeah, you know, from, go to Colgate. From, yeah, 17 years prior, it was prophesied that she would, <laughs> she would go. <laughs> Amen. Man, you manifested Amen. it, manifested it. There you go. Be, be careful what uh, one-year-old outfits you put on your children. <laughs> That's right, the moral right. to the story. <laughs> right. There you go. <laughs> so, so this is a great segue as you talk Excellent. about you, your 76 and 80 years, right? So first, let me ask, where are you from? Where were you born, raised? Let me born get and reared you. in Harlem, New York City. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Specifically, specifically, Sugar Hill. Okay. Wow. Oh, man, but this could be a great conversation. Than that, more specifically than that, the battlegrounds. Mm. For, you know for those battle who don't know, for those who don't know, what is that? The battlegrounds is a is a uh, a, a park that's on one hundred and fifty first street to one hundred fifty second street and Amsterdam Avenue. Yeah, okay. Uh, I don't remember yeah. the, the official name of the park, but, but it's, if you Google it, you Google you know Harlem the battlegrounds, and it was. Yeah. I mean, we had pro players that came there. It was also mm. they had the Rutgers. Mm -hmm. That was down mm -hmm. on, on 8th Avenue and 155th Street. But the battlegrounds was well known for professional players coming up there to play. And unfortunately, it got its name because many of the basketball games ended in with gunfire. Right. Or chasing right. the referees out of the park or we'd be Bad. there playing in the neighborhood and uh, shots would run out, ring out. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was a true battleground. But uh, I'm thankful <laughs> That uh, oh. the Lord got me through there. And, yeah. uh, and well, I have to uh, ask, where, where, where'd you go to high school then? Went to, to John F. Kennedy High School in the in Bronx. In the Bronx, yeah. Okay. okay. I went to a, I was from the Bronx. I lived in the Bronx right by Kennedy, but I went to A. Phila Randolph on 135th and Convent at okay. City College. So right. we had reverse uh, <laughs> travel <laughs> experiences. Right, right. Yeah. So did, did you, did you, did you uh, diversify Randolph? Because Randolph used to be an all women's school. Uh, I, I did not, I, well, I was, it was co-ed at the time, but it was still okay. predominantly, and we're talking mm -hmm. maybe 95% African-American, 5% okay. uh, Latino, and that was okay. it. Now it's, it's more diversified because also the demographics and the community wow. have become more diversified. Right. Yeah, Kennedy was, uh, John F. Kennedy, I, I was one of the first classes in there. It, it opened up in 1972. Mm -hmm. I was hmm. one of the first group of students to yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I was the in the class of 76 was the first graduating class out of Kennedy to be at the school for four years. Got it. Got so, it. OK, so let's go back then. Yep, yep, yep. What's, what's, what's life like in 75, 76? Wow. What's life like not just in your world, wow. in your personal world, but also give us a sense of what's the world like? Global Vietnam, context. Um, like, give me all of that. What's life like then so for a high school student? It's it's just after Vietnam, post-Vietnam, high drug usage, mainly heroin, mm -hmm. extreme, <laughs> extreme corruption, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, abandoned buildings, buildings that were torched because mm -hmm. to, to get insurance. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was it was a, a police violence. Um uh, you know, going back just a little bit more than that, you had uh, the Audubon Ballroom, which is not mm -hmm. far from where I grew up, where Malcolm X was assassinated. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. His funeral was held a few blocks from uh, where I lived on, I think it was about 148th Street, 147th mm -hmm. Street and uh, Amsterdam Avenue. Uh, so it was just a, it was just a lot. It was a lot going on, but in the midst of all of that, I would say that uh, there was a lot of beauty 
in Harlem and always has been a lot of beauty and art mm-hmm. uh, because, uh, you know, the, the overwhelming majority of the folks that are living in Harlem, working their day to day, doing what they have to do are uplifting the community. Mm-hmm. And I think it's still the same today in many communities of color, African-American communities, African communities, uh, Latino community, all of these communities, uh, uh, indigenous uh, mm-hmm. communities. It's a, it's a small minority of folks that are tearing down. Correct. And the vast majority of people that are building up, constructive, trying to do something to make it uh, a positive difference. And so that's, uh, that's that, yeah. Appreciate that. How did you hear about Kobe? My uh, uh, guy that I grew up with named David Hargett, he was class of 1979. Uh-huh. Um, his dad, uh, James Hargett, God rest his soul, um, uh, was kind of like a dad to me, a father figure to me. He grew up in two buildings down from me. I was in 527 mm-hmm. and David Hargett was in 525. When I came up to Colgate on my school visit, I came and visited. David, who was a year ahead of me at Fra- out of Franklin High School. Okay. Uh, and he was a baller at Colgate. So he was on the starting basketball team there. And I was in track, track and cross country distance. And, uh, you know, since this is a podcast and I can't show, <laughs> well, that's why I'm being more graphic, but I've got uh, photographs that I could always show you of uh, one African on the cross country team at Colgate. Send it. Send <laughs> we it. Love we to need see that. It, please. We got to post that. Athlete. Please send yeah, that. We will yeah. put that up for people to share and see. Yeah, we do have, have a social. We have a social media account, so we'll post. Okay. Those yeah, I've, I've got some stuff. Daughters are a beautiful blessing mm-hmm. to us fathers. Daughters are. And amazing. the grandson. I'm telling you, you, you know, Colgate may get a grandson. Chris. All right. All right. Give me a sense now of, you said you're on the track team. What's life like at Colgate, 76 to 80? When we arrived there in 76, there was a Ku Klux Klan rally in East Hamilton, New York. Okay. This summer, just, just before we arrived there in the first week of July of 76, they had a Ku Klux Klan rally in East Hamilton, New York. Wow. Wow. <laughs> So, that contextualizes say, it. Say less. <laughs> you know, um, there. What you now know as the Sojourners. Uh huh. We started the Sojourners. I was in one of the. I was one of the original Sojourners. Praise the Lord! The Sojourners Gospel Choir at Colgate is still going on. Amen. Yes. And Patty Williams, her maiden name is Patty Williams. She goes by Mariko now. I still keep in touch with her. Um, she's living out in Denver, Colorado. She was one of the, the first d- d- student director, choir director for the Sojourners. And uh, so that's an example. We, we had the African dance troupe. We, I was one of the original ones with that. We started that. There was nothing like that. Um, we had a black theater group. I mean, pretty much everything that is like a legacy to some of the things that y'all have there now, we were one of the ones that just we didn't have it, so we're just like no choice but to just create it. Happen. It is. Um, so it was just, you know, uh, I enjoyed being a, 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 a NCAA athlete because it, it gave me that escape hatch. So every uh-huh. other week, I'm getting a chance to, whether it's with the track team or the cross country team, I'm gone. I'm gone. I could come back and get that. It was something about just getting that fresh relook you know you could tolerate colgate even more you know that you get mm-hmm. away every other weekend and, definitely helps definitely yeah. helps so y- you talked a little bit about it um what would you list as some of your accomplishments while you were there wow i i'm gonna tell you back we we had a saying when we were there because of the attrition rate that we had at colgate mm. we started off with about 50 uh, students, okay. something like that. And by the time four years went by, that had dwindled. To, you know, I would say it, 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 we lost at least 
60 percent so i mean a lot of people left a lot of people left for, for various reasons uh-huh. particularly the african-american males i mean there was only by the time we got through we called ourselves the endangered species parliament <laughs> funkadelic had a a song called endangered species and it's sad when i think about it but we just made light of it that's what that was our theme song Mm-hmm. endangered species mm-hmm. and we'd be at the cultural center dancing to it or whatever but we'd be like yeah we're an endangered species and so that uh give you an idea there um um uh, what was the cultural center like for you the yeah. cultural yeah. center was you could still it, it was it was one of it. it was primarily just black it was a more even though they call it the cultural center mm-hmm. it was more afrocentric uh, in nature, um, they had a working dark room in there. Uh, I remember that. I remember kitchen, that. Had a pretty good kitchen that was there. A um, lot of lot of materials. I, I I loved spending time at the cultural center. Um, a lot of parties. We did. That's definitely did. That was our <laughs> library. There was there was a library. It was a party center. The library. Um, but yeah, it was it, in that respect. It was a positive thing. But. One of the things I did not like, uh, and many others had that experience too. Uh, at that time, the um, depending on who was the director of the scholars program, um, the experience of the students could vary dramatically. And um, you know, the director that was there when we arrived in '76, the, I'll be quite honest with you, was more he was more like an overseer. I don't want to mention any names or whatever, uh, but uh, fortunately, uh, that program as well as the uh, the future programs along that lineage uh, got wiser in terms of how they selected the directors for that program because it makes a big difference. You so. mentioned in your in your comment earlier about the sort of opportunity to pivot as a student athlete, uh, getting away from campus, coming back, mm-hmm. sort of having a reset. Uh, you made reference to, it allowed you to tolerate Colgate. Um, I, I would love for you to expand upon that a little bit more from your personal experience, whether it was social, academic, political, uh, spiritual. What, what were some of the things that you encountered that you can recall that required that toleration that the escape to to another school for a weekend game? I also was a student athlete and and I and I had various experiences and being the only student of color on the, on the baseball team. Um, uh, so I'm very interested in hearing you talk about that exchange yeah. for yourself. Yeah, for me, uh, one of the biggest cultural shocks, and this is, this is coming from somebody who's born and reared in Harlem with all of the, both the negative and the positive things and growing up in that, in that setting. Uh, but what I found when I got to Colgate in 76, um, it wasn't uncommon for there to be people with bowls of drugs in their rooms. All right, I'm being honest. Yes, okay. sir. Um, uh, playing hockey in the hallways and knocking out windows. And, and uh-huh. a lot of, there was a lot of violence and just, you know, things of that nature. I wasn't, I'll be quite honest with you, even growing up in Harlem, I wasn't used to or didn't expect that to be at, Colgate, all right? And so quite surprisingly, one of my, an adjustment for a brother that was born and reared in Harlem was getting used to just destruction, violence, chaos, drug usage. <laughs> I'm like, wait, what kind of place is this, right? <laughs> and so, you know, for me, I'm like, what I did realize when in my early a uh, few months at Colgate and, and years there, is that one of the big differences between, say, uh, a challenged uh, community like Harlem and other places like Harlem, challenged economically, uh, politically, and, and in terms of resources, there's the one major difference I would see is that it's it's human nature, say, for example, for young people to maybe knock out a window cause some damage in the community. The difference is, the difference is when things like that happened in Harlem or in my neighborhood or in my building, there are windows that stayed broken or maybe they put some 
some uh, uh, tape on there that stayed that way for 10, 15 years. Whereas at Colgate, <laughs> if somebody breaks out a window in one of the halls while playing hockey, there's a bill in everybody's mailbox <laughs> that they determine who did it by, by Monday or Tuesday, and it's probably fixed within 48 hours. Right. Okay. So I, what I discovered early on in my years at Colgate mm. is that there's certain things that are just human nature. You know, things get broken. Right. People make mistakes. You know, kids, kids of all races, colors, creeds, or whatever, play baseball. Like Brother uh, Dubois was just mentioned. German just mentioned. Play baseball. Baseballs knock out windows. That's what they In do. Some communities that window will remain broken for decades. In another neighborhood, the window is fixed within 24 to 48 hours. Over time, you look at, well, why are these people living that way? You know, say the neighborhood with it, it, that's fallen in disrepair. It's, it's, they're not living that way. It's just uh, a difference in terms of uh, resources. But human nature it, it is gonna be the same. Either you had good home, rearing or you don't right. and there's no no race color creed or nationality has a monopoly on that mm. so that's what i discovered and and what's profound about that to me is that after being born and reared in harlem or uh, communities that lack resources i i noticed within myself that i was beginning to look at even myself and other Har Harlemites as what's wrong with us? Mm -hmm. Why do our why does why is our neighborhood looking like this and the other neighborhoods look clean? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't until I got to Colgate that I realized it was it had nothing to do with us be uh, the black folks or Latino folks or uh, people of color in Harlem being any different or any other right. uh, neighborhood of color uh, or or um, but uh how the resources are allocated, right? Very insightful. It's not our character. It's just lack of resources. Lack of Here's, resources. What were your, where, where did you live your four years at, Col at Colgate? You know, how did that play into your was, uh, tol good, tol tol tolerance? I was, Eaton, I was in Eaton my freshman year. Okay. Right? And then um, I went, I came out number one on the lottery. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, an apartment. <laughs> Yeah, I came out number one on the lottery, and then I uh, so I moved down to Newell. Newell, yeah, Newell apartments. We did that. We we stayed there yeah, our yeah. junior Newell, year. Our junior year. Yeah, I did Newell apartments, and I, I and the first year I got it's like okay. So what I did, I had two athletes with me. God rest his soul, um, uh, brother uh, Parrish, uh, Sheldon Parrish, who's passed away. He went to uh, Roosevelt High School. He played Good on the Bronx. football team. He was my roommate. And then we had another brother. I can't remember who it was, but he, uh, so he was on the football team and I had somebody on the basketball team. And uh, that lasted a year. And then I realized <laughs> it, it was it was too much. It was, it, nobody <laughs> was putting up, man. You know, it's, uh, you know, dishes piling up. I was like, no, I yeah, can't yeah, live yeah. like that. Uh -huh. So then it was like, hey, you guys gonna have to find someplace else. And then what I did, um, I had the single room and I gave the double room to um, um, Lona, Jack, and, and um, Sharon Balcom. Hmm. And that, those were, and they, um, we were roommates and God rest her soul, Sharon Balcom uh, was one of the folks that perished in the towers uh, oh, on 9-11. Wow. Wow. And, uh, and I still keep in touch with Lona. Um, and then, um, yeah, the years after that, I, 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 I'd have to talk to y'all offline about that, but I, what I did is I gave even my slot away at Newell apartment, but, uh, kept my name there. And, oh yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, and the deal was, I'll just, you know, carve out some space in the living room. All right. Right. <laughs> okay, Res okay. Resourcefulness. Resourcefulness. Here after that. I live, uh, he's passed away as well. Uh, he was the chairman of the, of the um, uh, philosophy and religion department, uh, R.V. Smith. 
uh, Professor R. V. Smith, and his his mother, his uh, wife had passed away. He had a he had a house that was down the street from Delta Upsilon D U. Mm -hmm. Off right. Yeah, it's it's around the corner off the, that in that first block, and um, he he found out that I was. I was basically probably the first and only homeless student at Colgate University. I, I just lived wherever. Mm. Uh, I lived wherever, you know, wherever I, you know, wherever I was studying, I had my sleeping bag. And if I was studying there, boom, you know, if, if we would, if we had a study group, I would wake up, we'd have, you know, I, wherever it was. <laughs> I definitely had another first. I don't think I've ever, ever, yeah, ever yeah, heard yeah, anybody that, say they were homeless at yeah, Colgate before. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you the reason why I did it is to, to take the financial burden off of my mom. Yeah. Right? My mom was, a. uh, uh so primarily raised a single mom. And I realized that um, I wanted to be able to have extra money to take the load off of her. Yep. And, uh, and anything I could do to do that, including living homeless for about a year at Colgate, it gave me additional resources uh, on my account that I could send home and I could do other things that I needed to do. Mm -hmm. Take care mm -hmm. of, them, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. That's what's up. That's what's up. Yeah. yeah, it is. Uh, is there anything you missed about your years at Colgate? Anything I missed? Looking um, anything you missed? I, I pledged Omega Sci Fi Fraternity Incorporated. Okay. Where? Where? Uh, I, there at Colgate. Well, it's actually out of the chapter out of Syracuse University. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 But there were brothers there at Colgate um, even before I got there. Um, mm. There were there were brothers at Colgate that pledged at Syracuse. And when I was there, there were several Omegas there that had pledged at Syracuse. Keith Alston, uh, Melvin Lewis, Mark Fury, and uh, there's another brother, I can't remember his name. But Please tell me you got some photos of, of when y'all on campus online. I have, that. I have some of that, but I, I, yeah, I could send you some of that. Yeah, we I, need that. I still keep in touch with these brothers. I was on the I'm phone. Sure. Keith Austin, he lived, he played on the basketball team, and uh, some of the brothers I've lost touch with. But yeah, I pledged Omega Sci Fi. You see, I've got some purple under this. Purple. I see the purple. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm being That's descriptive so again because this is a podcast. But yes, yeah, I have but... some purple there under this brown batik uh, uh, dashiki that mm -hmm. I just acquired from. From Sierra Leone, West Africa. Mm. Oh, I'm looking forward to hearing that part of the story. Yeah, that's getting on the tail end because I just got back from Sierra Leone. Uh, I was there for 40 days in November and December of 2020. Yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll uh, save that. We, we'll yeah, we don't talk about we'll get to that. Too. I don't want to knock your socks off yet, you know? No, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> we'll save that for the second part of the conversation. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, right now, we're going to take a break so that we can show some love to our sponsor. And then we'll bring it back after this commercial and finish up this conversation. So this episode is sponsored by Hope Murals. Hope Murals is a nonprofit that provides adolescent youth with an interactive experience of creative expression via an urban arts platform that stimulates both mental and physical development. Please visit their website at www.hopemurals.org to learn more and find ways you can support the work they do. Welcome back. Welcome back. Um, once again, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Hope Murals. We greatly appreciate all you do with our youth. Appreciate your sponsorship. If you are interested in being a sponsor, please send us an email at aftergatepodcast at gmail.com. Greatly appreciate your support. Make sure we shout out our network, the Defy Life Network, and um, also want to acknowledge that we are on all of your favorite streaming platforms if you want to listen to Aftergate. So from Spotify to Spreaker to Apple Podcasts and a whole list of other podcast streaming services, you can find Aftergate. So appreciate um, our growth as we are in episode number 21. So mm -hmm. let's bring it back. Let's bring it back with uh, Dr. Stephen uh, Redman. Uh, appreciate having you here. 
Um, so at this point in the conversation, we like to just ask our guests a question that has nothing to do with their um, accomplishments or particularly their time at Colgate. But in our um, discussions, you mentioned that you have uh, penned an article, authored an article called Dear Black People. And so I would love to hear you share the context of that article and just kind of give us a sense of what that article meant and meant to you and the relevance of the article. Well, the article, thank you for that question. The article was written on February, published February 17th, 1978. Um, as I said, the article is uh, called Dear Black People. And, um, and basically the article is written by the white elite to black people at Colgate. And in the article, uh, it's a very loving article, very compassionate article uh, by the white elite, but, uh, but there's various questions that are asked. And, and, and I'll just, I'm not gonna read all of it, but the, the, the uh, article and the letter addresses certain excuses that the uh, white elite believe that the people, the students at Colgate are using. And excuse number one was we have groups and individuals within our family who talk about each other and fight against each other. We have, um, uh, the administration does not cooperate with our efforts to do things that we want, or we don't have black faculty to do different things. And with each of what this, uh, uh, author is calling excuses, the uh, white elite responds to black people and basically says to them, hey, um, you're right. Everything you're saying is correct. However, if the administration, meaning the Colgate administration doesn't do anything, then do it yourselves. In other words, don't you know, while you're protesting and while you're petitioning and while you're requesting and while you're going through the channels, don't moan, don't just moan and groan. Mm, go make it happen. Put it into, make it happen. It, still petition, still protest, still, you know, request, put all yeah. your paperwork in, do all those kind of things. But in the meantime, make it happen. <laughs> Self-determination. Mm. Yeah, you know, and uh, so, yeah, that, that's what it addressed. It addressed some of those kind of things. And the thing that I found interesting about it too, on the same page, it happened to be Colgate advertising an event that was going to take place on campus at the end of that week. Uh, what was that, what's that title? Uh, the, the title of the event, which is on the same page as the article is, about reverse discrimination. Oh, wow. Wow, so they're talking about reverse discrimination in 1978. <laughs> so, so the divisions of social sciences and the university studies program did this program called reverse discrimination and American Dilemma Revisited. Wow, a debate that is pretty ironic. And look at who the debate was between. The debate was between Charles Hamilton who was the professor of political science at Columbia University and the author of Black Power. Mm. Oh. And Lawrence Silberman, who was the deputy attorney general of the United States and the major architect of the affirmative action policy. That took place in Black History Month, February 21st in the Bremer Theater. And wow. that was the same page that this article appeared on called Dear Black People. I wish okay. you think that was strategic. <laughs> this was the Black History. This was the February issue. So I guess they mm -hmm. were looking to have some content. That's yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But, um, It'd be interesting to to you know really read that article from a conceptual perspective and look at it, its applicability to the experience of students of color now on campus, wow. just to have almost like a longitudinal study of, you know, how one, much of this applies, how much of it applies, the sense of 
uh, going to make it happen or asking or, 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 or are they even protesting and mobilizing because we've heard stories about, you know, the, the, mm-hmm. the type of student of color that's at camp, that's at Colgate now versus those in the movement. But nonetheless, nonetheless, um, so, no, so you, 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 you kind of gave us that, that context, which is awesome because it, it puts a lot of things into perspective about who you are and your resiliency. But give us a little walkthrough of what happened after Coke, you know, wow. uh, I, 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 I know that, you know, you, you, you have quite a few, you know, but yeah. try to give us like the roadmap that, that you roadmap. took leaving Colgate. The roadmap initially, well, before the, the summer before my senior year, I have to start there because I went on a program called Operation Crossroads Africa. So I went to Africa for the first time in the summer before my senior year. Was that part of a Kogay study abroad or yeah, that was on your own? That's okay. a whole other thing. You just basically had to fashion things for yourself. I mean, there was no black studies mm-hmm. courses uh-huh. at Colgate. So what I did even in the summer before that, I took courses with Dr. Jeffries in City College. City College, uh-huh. Leonard Jeffries, yep. In the, Leonard Jeffries, you know, I took courses with him and arranged to have those credits transferred to Colgate. Mm-hmm. And then I went on the uh, the Operation Crossroads Africa. I went to Liberia for three months. Uh, Operation Crossroads Africa was started by a black pastor in Harlem mm. named Reverend Robinson. He was the ch- he was the pastor of Church of the Master in Harlem, and uh, that program called Operation Crossroads is still operating today. It's been operating from the 1960s. And it was recognized as being the precursor to the Peace Corps program. Wow. Kennedy, right. So even the Peace Corps program that is well known got its start. It was recognized that Operation Crossroads Africa started by a black minister in Harlem. Uh, uh, was, and so I went on that program uh, the summer before my senior year. Okay. And then came back and said, you know, I've got to go to the Peace Corps before I start law school. So when I graduated, I immediately, within about a month or so after graduating from Colgate, I was in Africa. And I stayed in Africa for over uh, almost two years uh, and then went to law school and decided I could not do a Colgate type experience uh, for graduate school. I'm going to go someplace where folks have some history, some African history. I went to an HBCU law school, all right? That was intentional. I went to to North Carolina Central University School of Law in Mm -hmm. Durham, North Carolina. At that time, there were only four historically Black uh, law schools, only four HBCU law schools out of almost 300 American Bar Association approved law school. Okay. So wow. you're talking what? 1%? Not, not uh, even not 1%, even 1%. Not even 1% of law schools are from HBCUs. Mm-hmm. All right. And so I went to North Carolina Central. And um, and it, it, you know, that was that was just, you know, wonderful experience. And um, and right after uh, graduating from there, um, I decided after doing a couple of internships with the army, I was like, I was the least likely person that anybody would like, Steve Redmond, you know? Did you enroll? Did you enlist? Did you enlist? No, I went in after law school, after passing the bar exam, I went into the the army judge advocate general corps. um, And here's why, here's why. I've always been into health and wellness. So what I did, I did a blind matrix. You know how you do those weighted matrices. I I listed my criteria for where I wanted to work after law school, uh, gave all my criteria weights, okay? And neutrally evaluated how these legal settings for working after law school stacked up based on my criteria. And guess what? The army came out to be the one, wow. all right? Now, and because of things that were of value to me, I enjoyed wanting to go to a law firm 
that requires people to get up and run and do PT and okay. get out and get some uh. fresh air every day before they go to work. <laughs> okay, uh. now that's considered a, a thing that corporations, oh yeah, we gotta have a wellness program. Well, guess what? The Army, Navy, Marine Corps, and Air Force, we got a built-in uh, wellness program. It's called PT. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's mandatory and everybody's out there. The whole organization, unless you're sick. And I was like, you know what? I don't like how they're doing it, but I love doing that. I, I love doing that anyway. So I, that, I was drawn to that. Um, as a lawyer, I did not, I enjoyed being with an organization that lets me get out every now and then and jump out of perfectly good airplanes while in flight, uh, repel from helicopters and uh, shoot weapons <laughs> and, and, and then legally advise the commanders of that unit to <laughs> adhere to the Geneva and Hague Convention, mm -hmm. you know, all in a day, all in a day's work. Mm -hmm. right? Um, so yeah, it was, it, you know, otherwise I would have been with the, I mean, if you think the energy, hopefully I'm, I'm not too energetic right now, but this is, <laughs> this is six, this is the 64 year old Steve Redman. All right. Huh. I'm calm and I'm cool, calm and collected now. <laughs> calm down in my latter years, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the army as a place to practice law turned out to be the best place for me. I got to travel all over the world. Um, they, another one of my criteria was, was I going to be with a law firm that would allow me to continue my lifelong uh, education, both formally and informally? Absolutely. All right. I went into the army with a JD. I left the army with two advanced law degrees and a master's of science in strategic intelligence from the National Intelligence University. Mm. Okay. I've never even heard of the National Intelligence. Well, look it up. You got to look it right, up. Right, 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 right. That's, That's on a need that. to know basis. That's if you don't you know, know about it, you 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 don't need to know about it. You could, you, could, you could Google it, but you have to you you it requires a top secret clearance to even be a student there. Mm. Okay. So I was the Lord blessed me to do that, um, and 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 those other degrees, and then the the law firm, if you want to look at it that way, when I retired. I had money left over in a GI bill. I said, you know, what am I going to do with this? I'm already, I already had a JD. I've got, you know, these other uh, degrees. I went ahead and President Obama, when he asked the equivalent of what President Kennedy asked, asked not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. President Obama asked a similar question. And it basically, I can't remember how he put it, but he made it very clear that you know, when he's elected now, that was no, like November of 2008, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he said, I can't do this alone. I'm challenging each and every person out there. And I, I took that challenge seriously. In that fall that President Obama was elected, I applied to a PhD program at Fielding Graduate University to get my uh, PhD in human and organizational systems and worked on that PhD throughout most of the uh, Obama uh, first term and a little bit into his second term and, and completed that, that, mm. that, uh, that uh, doctorate, you know? And so I'm just saying to you, that was one of the things that I was like, hey, um, this, this, this law firm has these benefits and travel all over the world and all this kind of stuff. Um, it was the place for me to be. It was the place for me to be. Yeah, that is a very refreshing uh, spin on working for the U.S. Armed Forces because I know a lot of vets and a lot of folks who are officers, and no one has ever broken down uh, the perspective of why working, looking at armed forces as an employer. Um, was so beneficial, although they benefited from all the things you mentioned, it was almost like a byproduct versus you going in with that weighted mm -hmm. scale, looking for 
an employer that would offer you that. So congratulations to to that, to that explanation, to the experience, and dope, dope. I'm, I'm hoping you're working on some memoirs or someone's writing an autobiography on you or something like that. Because I'm working uh, on something. I'm okay. Working on something. Okay. But you okay. know, it's important to do that weighted scale. You know, you know, I didn't like the results after I put all of the numbers in there, and I was like, oh, the army, really? But it <laughs> it met my criteria. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, and as I said, it, it was, it, you know, and then the money that it saves, the, 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 the true retirement that comes from that, the lifelong uh, medical. The assistance. world travel alone. Yeah, everything. All of those benefits, when I add it up, it's like, wow. You know, and my son, I didn't push the military on him. He went to the Air Force Academy, Tanae's younger uh, brother. Mm-hmm. Uh, he went to the Air Force Academy. And now the Air Force is playing, paying for all of medical school uh, at, uh, at, at UVA. And so, the, the, you know, I think that all people, no matter what color, race, religion, you know, sexual orientation, whatever, do an honest assessment of different employers of what the benefits, they all gonna have pros and cons. Mm-hmm. I think that the military uh, is one that a lot of times folks have to maybe take another look at. And it gave me the freedom to be at the table when decisions are being made in intelligence communities, uh, other special operations communities. I gravitated toward those types of assignments that, um, that a lot of people didn't want to take. I did some things down in Guant- Guantanamo Bay. I was a legal advisor uh, down there. Uh, mm-hmm. And, and I think it's important for uh, African Americans to be at the table, for Latinos Agreed. to be at the table. Okay. Oh, one of my advisors used to say, if you're not at the table, you're on the table. Well, so I think that, I table. think everybody plays a role, actually. I, I, mm-hmm. I honestly believe that you have some folks that are going to be at the table playing their role. And I think you have some brothers and sisters that need to be out in the streets. Correct. Playing their role it, it, across the spectrum. So I'm not saying that any one spot no, uh, no, no. is where you got to be because you could be a person of color, uh, uh, black, Latino, uh, indigenous, you know, at the table, but pushing policies and supporting policies that are diametrically opposed to any group's, you know, legitimate aspirations. I mean, so uh, it's what you do when that you're access. at the table. It's what you do when you're in the streets. Yeah. Not everybody that's in the street is doing things that are in the best interest of the people in those communities. So mm-hmm. I think that we got to look at what, you know, give some critical analysis to who is where and what you're doing where you are and mm-hmm. support each other mm-hmm. regardless. I hear that. So um, what I would like to do is we always ask a question of our guest in terms of if you had the opportunity to talk to Stephen, the 18 year old leaving Harlem, going into Colgate, what would that advice be? And then also, if you had the opportunity to talk to Stephen when he's graduating Colgate, what would that advice be? Very curious to hear your hmm. answer. The advice going in is to remember, always remember who you are and whose you are and to um, and and to uh, appreciate all of the sacrifice that came to get you where you are. Mm-hmm. And um, that would be the advice going in. Mm-hmm. And, and also to, um, you know, be in it, but not of it. As I said, you know, in any mm-hmm. given day, you know, you could see that, um, again, the drug uses at Colgate and things like that, alcohol and all of that, I just never, I wasn't into that when I was in Harlem. And I'd be doggone if I was going to go up to Colgate, to Hamilton, New York, and start getting into that. So health and wellness has always been something that's been important to me. Um, And uh, my favorite place would be part of that advice to this young Stephen coming in. Stephen, I see you're spending a lot of time up at Chapel House. That's a good thing. 
continue to do that. Chapel House ended up being a theme that now goes all the way into my health and wellness retreats that I do now in Cuba, the Bahamas. We take groups to Costa Rica. I do some stuff in Puerto Rico, up in, up in Massachusetts, upstate New York, and different places. And so Chapel House was that place for me when I was 18. I spent a lot of time up there. You know, that was my other getaway location. Uh, and I'm, it was an anonymous donor who gave that to Colgate. Okay. Wow. And, uh, and uh, I shouldn't assume that the anonymous donor is not black. Who knows, you know, mm. but, uh, but it, it's, yeah. So that, that was the advice going in, you know, uh, and uh, stay healthy, stay healthy along the way. Don't, don't, don't partake of the things that are going to tear you down over the years. And going out, you said going out. Yeah, yeah, into the into the world. Just continue to serve others. Mm. Continue mm. to serve others. Continue to serve others, and 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 do it every way that you can. And uh, it started with Peace Corps service, and then I went into what they call the service, mm -hmm. the army after the after law school, and that that's continuing. You know, that's continuing. That that thread of serving other people, you know, uh, for the last 600 consecutive mornings on Zoom, I do a health and wellness Zoom call called Christ Moves Now. Every morning on Zoom. At I no need that call. link. I need that link. Every morning at 6.50 a.m. Eastern Standard Time until 7.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. People are on there. And within that 30, 35 minutes, we pray, we praise the Lord, we do a devotional, and we move our bodies in worship of the temple of the Holy Spirit. Okay. And, and keeping ourselves strong uh, and keeping and sharing health tips and other things of that nature. And then we end in prayer. And it's grown all over the country. People come on. We got pastors on there. And it's, it, yeah. And uh, so that's on, on the way out, continue to serve. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's mm -hmm. dope. Sierra that's Leone dope. On, in October and no, in November, December of 2020, I went back to Sierra Leone, West Africa, and had not been there in 40 years. Uh, and the group that I put together, we brought medical supplies to some villages. We brought uh, uh, school supplies to some children and brought sports equipment to some children in some remote villages that even now, as it was 40 years ago, some of the same villages that I used to live in 40 years ago still have no electricity and no running water, no school. Mm. This is today. Mm. And the Holy Spirit, you know, led me, said, hey, go back. And during the height of our pandemic, I went back to Sierra Leone. And as it would be, that's the way the Lord looks out for stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Sierra Leone has the lowest incident of COVID-19 on the planet. Mm. Wow. Look it up. Mm. Look it up. So I'm thankful to have done that. And again, that's that thread of going on out the door. Uh, what the person would tell me, Steve Redman would say, hey, keep serving. Mm. Keep serving. You know, Amen. so um, after gate, part of our mission is to make sure that other alumni of color are aware of opportunities like that in terms of the Zoom link in your experiences. So what we want to give all of our guests is a platform, an opportunity that if there's anything that you'd like to promote, whether it's the Zoom link itself or where someone could access that, a website, just what would you like to share with our Aftergate listeners so that they can support and engage with you? The most important thing I'd want them to support before I even give you any of the information about what I'm doing, the slice that I'm doing, wherever you are, link up in the community with people that are in every single community that are into health and wellness and wholesomeness, a good living, okay? 
gravitate toward that, all right? The comorbidities that have devastated our community because now COVID has hit, has been, it's been devastating. And it's well known that far more than half of most of the diseases and ailments that we face as African-Americans and people of color and indigenous and, and Latinos are preventable. How are they preventable? They're preventable by us not getting sufficient sleep, us not drinking sufficient water, us not scraping our tongue, doing neti pot, eating properly, exercising every day. These are things that could be done in a matter of, like I said, I now getting to the one of the things that I do, I'm like thousands and thousands of other African Americans in every community that are offering at no cost oftentimes, health and wellness, stress management, meditation, yoga, it, it doesn't matter. It, it, don't, don't, I don't wanna put a label on any particular thing, but you know, um, but if someone was interested in the one thing that I'm doing among others, they would wanna go to www.namderyoga.com. That's N-O-M-D-E-R-Y-O-G-A dot com. But again, the emphasis, brother, and I thank you for asking that question. The emphasis is not on what I'm doing in my programs and my retreats that I do in different places. I don't want to, I want to de-emphasize that. If people want to contact me, feel feel free. But I'm more, it's more much more important for people to go within their own communities and find the people that are there, are there. So I, I want that, you know, come to, come to mind as a last resort. If you can't find anything <laughs> else, come to mind. But, uh, but, and I welcome anybody, you know, cause we have a lot to share, but I know that there's thousands of brothers and sisters that have uh, good information out there. And I'm yes. just hoping folks that get out there and use it. That's, that's, that's the message I would want to promote all of the folks that are out there doing that, that thing day in and day out. Well, we're going to close out on that message right there. So um, we are going to wrap up another amazing episode of Aftergate. Uh, Dr. Stephen Redman, we greatly appreciate your time, your insight, your willingness to be on our episode. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank we you. also want to make sure we thank our listeners, and of course, thank our network, the Defy Life Network. Make sure you support us on all of those streaming platforms from Spreaker to Spotify to Apple Podcasts, et cetera, et cetera. And look forward to more dope, dope episodes to follow. Yes, sir. Peace, family. Good night, everyone. You hear that? Listen closer. That, my friend, is the deafening sound of focus. It drowns out all the useless noise that can clutter the moment. Naysayers don't exist. Haters? Smaters? The peanut gallery? Who's that? When you're in your zone, all that noise and all that buzz is just elevator music. So, enjoy your journey, focus on your goal, and bask in the quiet roar that is progress. Because when it's your time to shoot that shot, spit that verse, or close that deal, the only voice that matters is yours, the fire life.